recording. Um, so it, it's, let me turn on my video just to give the introduction. Welcome everyone. My name is Lin Fung, a member of ANPC and one of the organizers of this webinar. Um, the presentation is about to begin and please note that this event is being recorded. All participants in today's event will also have access to the recorded version, which will be available within two business days after the live event. TISO will send you information for the recorded version of the event. Um, so now I would like to introduce George, uh, who is going to make a few announcements before the panel starts. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Lynn, uh, I would like to share my screen mm -hmm. for a second. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yep. Great. All right, so um, as I said, welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening in different parts of the world. Uh, my name is George Bornpas and I'm currently the um, ANPC chair. These are all our members, wonderful people from around the world um, that um, are working hard for all our affiliates. Uh, special thanks to the organizers of today, Lynn and Louis, and of course, everybody else that uh, worked for it in, um, as well as our speakers that will be introduced in a second. I just wanted to take this opportunity to um, make certain that we all have the latest announcements from TESO. I don't know, if, oh, there. So primarily the TESO 2020 virtual convention. Registration is now open until July 8th. So um, if you have not registered, please um, register. There is a special rate for uh, affiliate members. So if you have affiliate members that are not TESOL members, they can qualify for the TESOL member uh, price. The link and the instructions are on the My TESOL group. But if you need information, um, just let any uh, NPC member know and they should be able to help you. Also, there is a call for online professional learning instructors from TESO. So the information is on the website as well as on the Facebook page. You can apply for, um, the deadlines are July 3rd and July 15th for summer and fall and winter respectively. Um, finally, there's also um, registration for the graduate forms for masters and PhD that are um, before the convention. So that would be the 15th of July. And those are free of charge um, but you still need to register, right? Um, finally, the affiliate events for this year are going to come after the virtual convention. Usually they're before, but uh, this year we will be having the affiliate events after the convention and an email with the schedule will be coming in the next dates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. All right, everyone, good day. Um, TESOL International Association's Affiliate Network Professional Council is pleased to uh, present this panel today titled Shifting Affiliate Events Online, a Global Phenomenon. We're very pleased to welcome all of our panelists and I'll be introducing them very, very shortly. My name is Luis and together with Lynn, we will be moderating uh, this event today. Today's panel will last 60 minutes and include a question and answer period at the end. To answer a question, simply type your question into the chat box on the lower, um, I think it's left or right hand side, depending on, on where you see it. And then we're going to make sure that we record those questions and we're going to ask them at the end. Okay, so now um, it's my pleasure to introduce today's panel and panelists. As I mentioned earlier, our panel is titled Shifting Affiliate Events Online, a Global Phenomenon. In this panel, representatives from California, TESOL, 
Japan Association of Language Teaching, and TESOL International's conference, Conferences Professional Council will share the experience, their experiences, lessons learned, and steps for planning and conducting online conferences and or professional development events. The order of presentations today will be um, JALT, Japan Association for Language Teacher, Teaching, uh, KATISOL, and TESOL International Association. Our panelists today are Susan Gare is the president of KATISOL, which has been holding virtual events to serve its membership since March 2020. KATISOL is also planning for the virtual fall annual, annual conference these professional development activities have not only provided necessary support to educators where CATISO serves during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also contributed to the solvency of the organization. Marsha Shen is Sunburst Media President, Mission College ESL Professor Emerita, and serves CATISO as Webmaster, Interest Group Chair, and Teaching of Pronunciation Interest Group co-coordinator. As pronunciation doctor, she offers thousands of free videos for English language instruction, and uh, she shared her um, the link in her bio. Wayne Malcolm has a doctor of education from the University of Phoenix in the U.S. with a specialization in global competence, public speaking, and language assessment. Wayne teaches at Fukui University of Technology where he assists the student body in reaching their desired English language abilities and potential. An active member of the Japan Association of, for Language Teaching, Wayne has held many positions in the organization, from chapter to national office, officer. He's currently the director of program who oversees the coordination of JALT's annual international conference and educational materials exhibition. Our next panelist is Rana Khan, is the chair of the conference's professional council, TESOL International Association. She also has served as conference chair, proposals chair, and secretary of TESOL Kuwait. She has extensive teaching experience from various educational institutions in Kuwait. Rana holds a master's degree in English literature and business administration, besides a CELTA certificate. Currently, she works as English and business instructor, instructor at Algonquin College, Kuwait. Her main research interests are learning management systems, CAL, and blended learning. And last but not least, Lisa Dyson began her meeting and event planning career with the USO of Metropolitan Washington in 1997 and was named Director for, of Conference Services, now Director of Strategic Events at TESOL International in November 2006. Prior to that, she was director of meetings and conventions for the Association of the Wall and Ceiling Industry, PCMA. An active and engaged member of, meetings, of the meetings industry, she has held various committee positions for PC, PCMA and served of, on several different advisory boards for convention destinations. Lisa holds a BS in marketing and obtained her CMP designation in 2006 and DES designation in 2015. Once again, welcome to all of our panelists. Wayne, let's get started. Okay, let's start my video. And I'll start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that okay? Or who's the monitoring people? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let me begin. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me here at uh, 11 o'clock in Japan, 11 p.m. in Japan, uh, bright eyed and bushy tailed. Um, so I'll be talking from the JAL perspective uh, from the Association, uh, Japan Association for Language Teaching. And uh, the things I'll be talking about are JALT just in general, the organization itself, and then two conferences we just recently completed um, that went from face-to-face -face online. Also the planning for the international conference that will be in November, some, and uh, what said in the beginning there, some tips and ideas that um, 
we're using for planning that international conference. So let's begin here. So JALP membership, as you can see on the screen, it's a very diverse membership of 2,541 people uh, as of May 31st. And uh, we are spread all across Japan. And you'll see next in 32 chapters. So each chapter is a geographical region um, from all the way from Hokkaido straight down to Okinawa. We have chapters all across Japan. Um, so that's, that's the, one of the main structures of JALP. JALP also has another structure that uh, builds this membership, uh, the special interest groups. And you'll see on this slide, um, there's about 28 special interest groups um, and from everything from augmented reality to teachers helping teachers, literature. So there's a wide variety of special interests for people to get into once they join a JALP chapter. Um, from here, moving on, we're gonna look at the two conferences that just recently completed and went online. The first one is the JALP Call Computer Assisted Language Learning Conference. And as you can see with this chart uh, over the course of the past few years, um, yes, there have been quite a few people. Uh, it's a special interest group. Uh, and this year we had smaller number of presenters, but higher number of non-presenters because we went to the online format. And uh, you can see that, yeah, this was very much a participants conference more than a presenters conference. Incidentally, some presenters actually chose not to join because of, um, this was so earlier, much earlier in the year and they were a little skeptical about how a online conference would go. Um, and, but we had quite a good showing from 29 countries for uh, our special interest group. So that's, this was the first conference in the JALT, uh, kind of the JALT family of conferences that went online. Um, and overall, it was a good success. Uh, we had our own particular um, website built for this conference that allowed access to the conference. And uh, yeah, I'll talk more about that a little bit later, but that from all accounts, this was a good, this was a good showing. Um, the next showing was the PANSIG conference before I, sh I showed you the slide of all the SIGs that were on that are part of JOLT. Well, this conference is specifically for those SIGs, run by those SIGs. So, um, and as you can see here though, there was a little bit more, still good number of presenters, still good number of non-presenters, um, went down a little bit here. Situation was that, uh, yeah, planning was a little, um, was, uh, wasn't as seamless as we had liked, although we use the same website system and that was seamless, that was great. Uh, but the publicity was not where we wanted it to be. Um, so maybe that's a little bit of a tip there is to really kind of make sure the publicizing of a online conference goes well. But one of those things that we learned still, we had very good representation um, from even, even from past years, we still had very good representation. Uh, next, talk about the JALP International Conference experience. Really, this is our marquee event through the year. Uh, happens usually in November, uh, made up of really three big things, the professional development presentations and workshops. We also have a really big um, educational materials exhibition where the, all the different publishers and our associate members and uh, people who have their product lines come to our conference to yeah, get access to the teachers and the people in the field. So that's a really big part of our conference. And then we also have the socializing and networking side is a really big, we have quite a few social events and the networking aspect of JALT International is a really big thing. Never let it be said that language teachers don't like to socialize. If we like to socialize, we, we get paid for talking to a degree and teaching how to have conversations. So that's something we do like um, to get to know each other and network. So the task is how do we replicate this on a very large scale because JALT generally draws, I mean, for us, JALT's uh, at low point, 1100, high point, 1800. So you're looking at roughly any given time, 13 to 1500 people, um, participants in our conference. How do we replicate this vibrant, very, very vibrant interactive situation? So our ideas here that we're working with 
is uh, the main thing is our tech interface. Have no site, no conference, it says. Uh, we're using a site that's going to be called Eventzilla. Uh, it was designed actually by one of our members. One thing about Jolt is that we're all volunteers. So there are really very few paid staff. We have a paid office staff, but we're all volunteers. So when someone does something, like our uh, friend here, Gary Ross, a Jolt member, he created this website uh, portal for our conference, which was, which was amazing. And um, so, but it works very well for our purposes. And that's one of the big things. If we didn't have this, we probably wouldn't even be talking about really having an online uh, conference. So that's a really big thing. Uh, another thing with that, having a dedicated team, uh, we're putting, so we put together a dedicated team to work the site and all the other different tech uh, aspects with a technical director, Paul Collette, who is our, uh, one of our members. Um, the planning and training, we have, we're going to need a, a lot of members, volunteers, so to protect mostly really against burnout because uh, monitoring Zoom rooms, it may sound, I don't know if it sounds easy, but definitely what we've experienced is that it's not easy, uh, making sure all the little details go right. So we need good training and volunteers. Also flexibility in our schedule. This year, usually our conference is over one weekend, but because it's online, uh, we're looking at making it a week so that we can sort of build up to the main event over the weekend, kind of build that thing about publicity, build up the momentum into the main weekend. And then where the main weekend also isn't so cram packed with so many presentations and meetings and everything, if we can spread it out because we have this online format. So we're gonna be going to that this year, see how that works. Um, we're also looking at a uh, new call for proposals, a very limited call focused on emergency remote teaching and learning. Uh, this really speaks to the moment that we're in. So we decided to do that as well. Again, with the flexibility, we figured let's speak to the moment and get more voices into our conference in streams that weren't really there. So, and last but not least, but one of the most important things, of course, is pricing. Jolt International will not be free. Our other two conferences were free, but because of the way our organization runs, our conference brings usually brings in a considerable amount of operating revenue that allows other things in our association to run. So we're looking at a um, tiered pricing where we also uh, have a pricing scheme that allows global professionals, a little outreach to global professionals, people who are outside of Japan, maybe in developing economies who uh, may be usually in normal years uh, don't, don't have access to Japan because of travel costs, visa, et cetera. But now if they can get to an internet, uh, location that provides good internet, they can join JOLT and uh, yeah, attend the professional development that they seek. So yes, COVID-19 has forced, forced us into cyberspace, but with the good success of JOLT Call 2020 and PanSIG, we're really looking forward to scaling that up to JOLT 2020. Uh, we, we, we feel good that we can put on a good conference and keep those positive things that happen in the physical space but also embrace the flexibility that comes with operating in cyberspace. So we're really gonna embrace that. Uh, one of the last things that I think really allows a good online conference or any conference in general, this is just, I think a tool, just a general tip, good communication networks. So, so important to have a system of communication that works for you. We use Slack and some email, and that seems to really work for us. Um, However, another organization does that, but just develop a good communication system that really works within our structure, uh, um, within your structure. So with that, JAL 2020 will be an online conference. If you have any, obviously there'll be more questions and comments uh, at the end. So feel free to uh, drop them in the chat. Thank you so much. And uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Thank you very much. And I will here unshare. Stop my sharing here. Where's my, oh, sorry. Technical difficulty. Am I not sharing anymore? It's still showing, Wayne. Um, it's still, yeah, I'm trying to get out of my unshare. You should be right on the top um, or even on the bottom where it, shows, where it says uh, share ah, screen. There it is, nope, I was uh, covering it, sorry. <laughs> 
I was covering it myself. Stop share. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. My, and next have, we have my person bar was covering it. Sorry. That's that's wonderful. Thank you. Don't worry. Uh, and then we have Katiso, Susan, and Marsha. Thank you. So Marsha will be sharing the screen for us. And welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Susan Gare, and I am the president of Catisol. I took over. Um, we are now doing a two-year presidency. So I took over last October, and I will have one more year until October 2021 as president. Uh, go ahead. Next, Marsha. So we were established in 1969, and I'm happy to say we now have 1,800 members. I think we are the largest US affiliate, and I think we come in second after JOLT. Um, we have 10 chapters throughout California. We usually have our annual state conference in the fall, but this year, of course, we're going virtual. Um, we have regional conferences in the spring, which were canceled this year. And we have chapter events throughout the year, which have all been canceled since January. All right, I'll take over here. Well, thanks and welcome. Good morning, good evening to everyone. I'm here with Susan, my name is Marsha Chan, and we're here from Catisol. And as you know, due to the COVID-19 shelter in place, Catisol had to swiftly pivot, and we did, to our web-based professional development. We canceled those three uh, regional conferences slated for spring, this year to 2020 and the annual state conference later for fall. Uh, in the meanwhile, we immediately provided a total of 65 hours of coaching webinars in March, uh, which we wrote about and that's in the uh, affiliate newsletter from the previous month. Uh, we pretty quickly and efficiently planned, organized and presented our very first virtual conference May 8th and 9th. And now we are in uh, the process of planning our virtual state conference in October. And uh, one of our conference chairs, Margie Wald, is here with us. So if you have more questions about that, uh, put them in the chat. Uh, we'll talk more about our Catisol 2020 Spring Virtual Conference, uh, which we put on in a really short time, like month, month and a half. Um, and we were able to do so because we had some really great um, active, dedicated uh, team members, Susan, myself, Margie, Leah, Cami Stein, uh, Nancy Kwong Johnson, and Amy Bascucci, and we rammed it all out and had a great time. So here are some conference planning considerations. Uh, consider the online platform availability, uh, what kind of presentation modes there are, what desired features you have for interaction or engagement with your audience, of course, affordable pricing. Um, consider your uh, registration process. Um, if you're gonna have exhibitors, do you need to have uh, exhibitors? Then you need to find out what features there are for that. How about your user interface? How easy is it for attendees to uh, get into it? Uh, will you want to caption and edit videos for mass production later on? Uh, is there a way to archive your videos and your handouts? What kind of technical support do you have prior to the event and during the event? We did both traditional and social media outreach. Um, through our system at Catisol, we blasted our members with um, our conference information. We used our Catisol Facebook, Catisol Instagram, Catisol Twitter. Uh, we came to this group, to Catisol Affiliates Group, and of course, individuals uh, did their own um, social media with LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And we contacted our friends, our colleagues, different schools and to TESOL affiliates to let them know about our conference. Here are a couple of fast facts about our spring virtual conference. We um, gave it over two days, Friday, May 8th. We did an afternoon from one to 6 p.m. We had two stages, which is like two rooms. And Saturday, we also had two rooms and went in the morning from nine to 2.30 p.m. We had five featured sessions, that means those presenters were unopposed, and we had 10 concurrent sessions, which meant that attendees could choose from one, um, two presentations at that time slot. We're very uh, pleased that we were uh, able to have partnership and um, some sponsors of the event. For our attendees, we had such a short time to plan this, we thought, oh, maybe we'll get 100 people. Well, we actually got 485 uh, registrants. 
and half of them were CATESOL members and half of them were not. So some of them came through the TESOL affiliate program where we allowed people to register as if they were CATESOL members. We also had uh, some students and we had people from all over the world um, and we garnered some new members from um, our event. We had comments from participants afterwards when we did our evaluations and I'm going to share with you just a few of them. One person said, the conference was well organized with a variety of interesting topics and knowledgeable speakers. The planners did an outstanding job in a most challenging time. I attended both days and thoroughly enjoyed every session. Another attendee wrote, you pulled off an inexpensive, interesting and nurturing conference at, the ver at very little cost to participants. I could participate in professional development while taking care of my children. Thank you all who helped make it happen, especially the committee and the presenters. And finally, another one, learning so much, having such a variety of topics to choose from and listening to excellent speakers, but most of all, being able to take away so many ideas and activities that I can use right now in my classes, as well as when I start planning ahead for next quarter. It was also so refreshing to be able to attend a conference in the middle of this COVID-19 crisis get some good professional development, take a break from everything. I have so much to do for my classes right now, as everyone does, but the two days I spent attending all of these sessions were such a breath of fresh air for me. Well worth every second. Thank you again for organizing this conference. The timing was perfect. So here's what we consider our ingredients for positive outcomes. First of all, start out with dedicated, industrious, tech-savvy organizers, plus excellent speakers, plus program variety, plus clearly described logistics, plus reliable technical interface, and what do you get? A successful conference. Here are some tips. Now these are tips to ourselves for our future conference and those that we wish to share with others who are considering going virtual in the future. Provide speakers with lists of effective practices and strategies for moving presentations online. From the proposal, indicating active engagement methodology, to content, to presentation. Consider marketing beyond your usual scope. Geography is no longer a constraint. We advertised on the affiliate network, community board, and several non cathedral members heard about our event from members' reposts on social media. Overcome technical difficulties by adequate onboarding and prior practice with the equipment and platform. Spend time preparing speakers' technology for web presentation, internet, microphone, earphones, video, lighting, control slides, media, and other interface features. If you register on your organization's platform, make sure that the conference vendor you select has the correct interface for your platform. Make video tutorials and checklists for presenters and for registrants. And if you get this presentation, you can click on this link to find out what we wrote for our presenter onboarding tips. Train two moderators for every session, one for Q&A. One for chat. Q&A moderators should limit their roles to asking the questions posed by attendees. Besides presenter tracks or stages or rooms, provide additional ones for participants to interact with each other informally. Ideas that we got from other virtual conferences include a lobby, a hall, coffee break rooms, which are open to anyone at any time, and maybe a way for a presenter to say, you know, let's congregate, let's get together, and let's gather in such and such a place after this chat or after this topic is over, as the workshop is over, so we can, you know, chat a little bit more about this topic. Provide ways for um, attendees to interact, to network with other participants. Provide tracks or stages or rooms for exhibitors for job seekers, for employers. Keep prices affordable, low. Costs can be considerably lower 
And conferences have been able to attract a larger number of people as geography is not a constraint. Pick some big names to draw in registrants. If you keep prices low, you need volume for strong profits. Thank you very much for listening to our points and we'll have more to say during the chat, especially if you wanna know about our upcoming conference in October. Thank you so very much, Susan and Marsha. That was wonderful. And uh, next we have Rana and Lisa and Susan Winnie. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Rana and Lisa. Okay, uh, so can we share the screen now? Yes, thank you. Can you see our screens? Yes. Uh, okay, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Rana Khan. Uh, I'm the current chair for uh, Conferences Professional Council, Diesel International. I'm here today with uh, Ms. Lisa Dyson, who is the Director of Conference Services and also staff partner to uh, the CPC or the Conferences Professional Council. We are going to talk about shifting affiliate events online, a, a global phenomenon. Uh, sorry, yeah. So uh, first of all, we are going to give you a very quick overview of what we're going to talk about. First, we'll give you a short description of the affiliate and its membership, what events TESOL has moved uh, or is planning to move online, the major steps and considerations in planning for the events. Uh, uh, we are also going to talk about the outcomes of the conference uh, or the events, the success, and the attendance, engagement, feedback from attendees. And last but not the least, we are going to talk about uh, we'll make some comparison from the past face-to-face -face events to uh, the virtual events. So TESOL International uh, was founded in um, 1966. It's a professional community of educators, researchers, administrators, and students uh, committed to advancing excellence um, in the English language teaching for speakers of other languages. It's an organization committed to advancing excellence in English language teaching. So I'm so sorry. Uh, it's also, um, it, it can very proudly boast uh, of a, a large membership of roughly 12,000 members uh, that represent more than 156 countries. It fosters this exchange of ideas, research, and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge, and provides expertise, resources, and a powerful voice on issues of affecting the profession. Uh, let's quickly have a look on the offerings from TESOL International. Uh, TESOL offers uh, professional uh, development opportunities through its uh, professional development programs, international convention, which is held annually, its special interest groups, professional learning networks, its publications and quarterlies. Uh, TESOL engages thousands of professionals uh, to collaborate glo globally and creates a world of opportunity for millions of people of all ages who want to learn English worldwide. Some of the benefits of TESOL International membership uh, include attending and learning through webinars and symposiums. Uh, they can also stay current and get published uh, in TESOL journals and TESOL quarterlies. Uh, they also have an opportunity to connect and collaborate through my TESOL and other communities of practice, namely special interest groups and different professional learning networks. Uh, TESOL members also can receive recognition and funding through awards and uh, grants for academic and professional growth. Uh, they also, uh, also have an opportunity to get involved and lead the organization um, through different leadership roles in the form of uh, professional councils or uh, by uh, or through the leading the board. Uh, let's have a look at the annual TESOL convention, which is one of uh, its major uh, convention, one of the large, which can easily claim to be one of the largest uh, professional development event in the TESOL field. Uh, it draws more than 6,000 attendees from around the globe. 
And one of its major attractions is it's for plenary speakers, which come from diverse backgrounds and are unique speakers. Um, we also have uh, more than, we can, we can claim to have more than 900 educational sessions and uh, one, more than 150 exhibitors. TESOL also offers uh, professional development opportunities to English language educators and offers a global perspective on English language teaching through the exchange of ideas and practices. Through its different educational sessions, TESOL integrates knowledge of uh, current trends and the field of um, English language teaching while developing a professional network. Um, so I'm the, the chair to Conferences Professional Council. Um, I and my team, we help and collaborate with the TESOL International Association staff on uh, the program content. We help in developing a framework for determining themes, tracks, and topics for the annual convention. Uh, it's also one of our uh, duties and responsibilities to uh, provide a unique and uh, unique and outstanding keynote speakers and invited speaker sessions. So invited speaker sessions are, of course, uh, these are offered by uh, by speakers who are experts in this own field, uh, and they talk about diverse topics. Um, it's also one of our roles to develop the call for proposals and the proposal uh, review process. Uh, and with the help of strands, we create a vibrant convention program uh, uh, that is uh, that is uh, basically uh, respond that responds to the changing trends of uh, the educational field. Um, these, uh, the CPC also continuously evaluates the relevance of current conference and convention programming uh, and assists the association staff in enhancing the attendee experience at the annual convention. So um, recently, TESOL hosted its Advocacy and Public Policy Summit uh, from 22nd to 24th of June and is planning to host its virtual convention from 16th to 18th of July. Um, so this virtual convention 16 to, uh, that, is, that is going to be uh, hosted from 16th to 18th of July is not a replacement of the Denver Convention, which, uh, which was uh, uh, scheduled uh, in March end and of course couldn't take place because of the current pandemic. And to talk more about its details, what are the strategic goals and objectives? What are the steps in planning? I would invite Lisa to talk more about it because she's the superwoman behind the virtual convention to be very honest. And uh, I, I would like her to share her views and, and what she has been uh, planning. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Rana. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, can you go to the next slide for me and we'll jump in? Mm -hmm. So, one of the first things you have to really consider when you're thinking about taking your virtual events online is really what are your strategic goals and objectives for this event? Um, is it purely to make money? Is it a member benefit so it's free to everybody? Is it a PR thing? Um, is it purely professional development? Likely it's probably all of the above for most people. Um, but once you figure out what your real goals are, then you can begin to figure out what platforms you will, will meet your needs. Um, there are hundreds of platforms out there at various price points and various ways to do a virtual event. So you really have to spend some time thinking about what's gonna help you achieve your goals the best. Next. So considerations, are you gonna live stream all of your presentations? Um, that certainly is an option. It also presents some big challenges. Um, you're going to do synchronous sessions. Are they going to be all recorded, asynchronous, combination of both? Um, are you actually going to have an exhibit hall? That's a whole different dynamic. What about your sponsors? What are you offering them that's going to make them want to spend money on your particular event? Um, and we all know that networking is one of the biggest things that people look forward to at a face-to-face -face event. So how do you replicate that, that experience in an online platform? How do you foster that engagement? Um, budget is always a big consideration, even for TESOL International Association. Um, cost of the platform is one of your biggest things you're gonna have to consider. Um, speaker fees, I've seen there's a couple questions about speaker fees. Um, 
generally you can negotiate a slightly lower speaker fee with your keynotes for an online conference because they don't have to travel but it wouldn't be necessarily um, a drastic reduction in fees depending on who it is um, obviously you're going to need tech support who, who's going to provide that is it provided by your platform is it some outsource people you have to recruit um, you've got to make sure it looks good so you're talking about um, graphic design marketing what if a true marketing plan um, one of the mistakes a lot of people make is not really having a full marketing execution plan for their events um, that can make or break you for sure um, revenue um, this is really part of your overall strategy is it free registration is there a fee are there a bunch of different tiers um, that's really something you really have to think about and it really ties into what your overall objective is for the event um, sponsorships are you know a lot of us depend on sponsors for our events um, you have to really think through what the packages are going to look like and what those price points are it's a slightly harder to bring value in a sponsorship for a virtual event than it is a face-to-face -face, but it certainly can be done and then if you are going to have an exhibit hall and exhibitors what's that strategy um, is it going to be a very small um, fee to have a virtual booth to get people to engage and try or are you going to try to actually um, put a higher price tag on it depend because of the larger potential audience. So there are a bunch of different things to consider. Next. So one of the biggest things that we struggle with um, at TESOL International Association is the fact that our, we know our audience is global and trying to figure out when to schedule events so that every the most people can participate without killing the TESOL international staff that is based on the east coast of the United States. Um, the other thing that actually plays a, a role in for us is tech support hours for the platform. The platforms that we work with have actual tech support teams and they have a set schedule that they work. Um, and in order to make sure that everybody can have access to tech support should they need it, that, that, that factors into what our schedule looks like. Um, we grapple with how many hours, how many days, how many sessions. And there are so many things you can do, but one of the things that we recognized very early on is there was not possible to completely replicate and replace our face-to-face -face large convention um, with a virtual event. So we really had to think about um, paring that down, but still giving people an opportunity to present because they didn't get to present in Denver. So uh, we did just have an extremely uh, successful virtual TESOL Advocacy and Public Policy Summit. Last year, our face-to-face -face meeting um, had 102 people. Um, they actually went to Capitol Hill and had 175 meetings with uh, members of the Senate and the House and they actually worked on um, or reviewed policy statements. We actually issued eight policy statements last year. So, um, so it's a good event, but it is generally around 100 people um, because it, there, it does involve travel for most folks. So we had to pivot to um, virtual this year because of the, pan the pandemic. Um, it's one of our most popular events um, as far as the attendees that go get a, a ton out of this particular event um, and they tend to repeat attendance. So our event that we just had, uh, we actually had triple our normal attendance. We had 306 total registrants. Um, we actually did the entire event on Zoom. Uh, we actually, and we had 15 sessions on a bunch of different topics uh, related to advocacy and public policy. And because it was online, we had a higher global audience than we typically would for our event here in the DC area. So a quick look at who attended. Um, you can see that we had people, global professional folks, which meant we had a very global audience. Um, and then we also had some non-members and some retired folks participate. So it was kind of like a little bit of, of everybody. Uh, which was really fascinating to see who decided to join the event because it was virtual. So um, last year, the, our annual convention um, was a little smaller than average, actually. We had about 5,300 attendees. 
over 100 countries represented in our attendees, over 1,000 sessions, and over 100 exhibitors. So that's the scale we're used to working in. Next. So um, with the shift to virtual convention, um, I wouldn't even call it a shift to a virtual convention. Um, it's really just designing our first virtual convention. And I would say that this was a more reactive event than um, kind of strategic proactive event than I would have preferred. Um, but we kind of had to do something and we had to do it relatively quickly. So we still have our four keynote speakers. Uh, we'll still we'll have about 100 sessions for folks to attend. And we're actually on track to have about 3000 attendees, which is really large for a virtual event. Um, we'll have over 20 exhibitors and our sponsorship revenue actually exceeded our budgeted goal. So by all accounts, the it's looking like it's going to be an extremely successful event, but obviously it hasn't happened yet. So we'll see what happens. Hopefully everybody loves it. So that's kind of us in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer questions and give more detail. Well, you are all invited. Thank you very much, Lisa and Rana. Thank you. And now we're going to transition into the question and answer period. We do have 40 minutes left. So um, let's go ahead and do one question for um, panel presentation at a time, if that's okay. And I know some of you were already answering the questions in the chat box, but um, the first question, it's going to be for Wayne. And Wayne, I'm actually going to uh, copy and paste here in the chat box the question. It's a three-part question. Mm -hmm. So how much back-end work was required for event zill.la? Is event zill available for use outside JALT? And what did event zill website portal provide it that other, other portals did not provide? Yeah, uh, so on the first, that uh, first one, the back end, um, really it was, a, it was kind of a one man show. So one of our volunteer members, who's a member of the computer assisted language learning SIG, He's also a programmer and they asked, um, after looking at various other portal, other sites, other, but it just wasn't within the budget, like their budget. So he offered to build a portal for their SIG conference. And so according to him, it took a long time. It took a lot of time, but he did it basically in like three weeks straight of everyday programming, setting things up and building all the administration work on the back end. And from what I've seen, he's showed it to me and various other people in the organization. People have, we, we've obviously used it in two conferences. Um, it's a very clean system for uh, maybe non-tech people. When it says, when, when people say clean, it means there's not a lot of clutter on the screen. There's not a lot of buttons to click here, there. It's a very easy system to use. So that, that's what clean means, very easy system to use. There's not a whole lot of, uh, um, he can get in and show you fairly easily how to program, how to, how, to, how to use the system, how to administer it. So once you get into it, it can be, it's very user friendly. Um, so not so much time there. For him, programming it, it took some time. Obviously it's not an easy thing to do. So that's a little bit on the back end work that was used to create that in terms of can it be used outside of JALT? I'm sure it can. He hasn't told me any plans of that, but he is designing it so that it can be customized to other organizations. It doesn't necessarily have to be a JALT thing. Um, he has said it doesn't have to be a JALT thing and that it can be customized, but he hasn't told me any plans for to do that. Right now, his uh, focus is, his focus was JOLT call, JOLT pan sig, and really kind of geared towards JOLT 2020. Um, but that would have to be discussed because he basically owns it. It's just like, it's his. So, uh, and what did events of portal provide? Uh, really what it provided was in-house control. So he's a member of JOLT. Really it provided uh, easy turnaround, um, we didn't have to hunt around for someone who get, has to get to know JOLT. Um, 
it's not someone we have to call up and say, okay, hold while we contact you with don't, this person, that person. Uh, he's a member of JELF. He's very responsive. Um, he has vested interest because he is a member of JELF. So he has real vested interest in making the site run really well. So the buy-in there is very easy to happen. And I think that's something, once you get that buy-in, it's really easy, you know, you can really work with that person to make the site the way you want. So really, it was very easy, very personable, and very also very quick and very user-friendly so that we didn't have to hunt around for a lot of things. And again, he knows Jolt, so it was very easy to work with. So in those respects, other portals didn't really, couldn't really compete with that. Couldn't really compete with that, even at whatever price point they wanted to put, they couldn't really compete with that because in the end, um, yeah, he was, I say he was one of us. So it was very easy to, it was very easy to work with. He knew, he knew our, he knew what we wanted. I think that uh, that was all three parts. I hope I answered that. Yes, thank you very well. much, Wayne. I appreciate that. And um, I'm going to ask now a question for Marsha and Susan, then for Rana and Lisa, and then we're going to do a second round. Hopefully, if we have time, a question, a general question for all of you. All right, so Marsha and Susan, um, your question, I'm actually going to add it here to the chat box as well. What topics do you consider for concurrent sessions? How can conferences meet the interest of K through 12, higher education, adult education, et cetera? So I, I, I would be happy to answer that one. So we had to cancel our three regional conferences. So we decided, and they had already sent in proposals for those regional conferences. So we chose our concurrent sessions through those regional conferences to make those, peop those members feel valued who had already submitted proposals. So we did not accept any proposals from new people except for our uh, featured speakers. So everything came from our regional conferences, which were all canceled. Anything to add to that, Marcia? No, you did a good job. Can I, I think that answers it. Um, hi. Uh, I think that also we, we did try to make sure that, that the um, presentations focused on the remote uh, instruction issues that, that people have been facing. And I think we took care of uh, the different levels by making sure that the people who were presenting about different online opportunities looked at it from a multi-level perspective. And we also were very careful about how we chose the invited speakers. In the chat, you should find a link to the program where you can take a look at exactly who spoke about what. Thank you very much, Susan, Marsha, and Margie. And uh, next question is for Rana and Lisa. And I'm also going to copy and paste here the question. How do big name presenters expect to be paid for a digital conference? I'm familiar with how to pay them when you bring them in. Do they change their pricing or is it generally a set fee? So I guess pricing for presenters. Pricing for the keynotes particularly. Yes. So um, it's kind of a little bit all over the board. Um, in general, they will take a reduced fee from their normal in-person honorarium. Um, but I would say, caution, don't expect them to make it rock bottom. There's still um, a quite a lot of time and preparation that goes into an online pr presentation. It's not like it's just you wake up in the morning and you present. So that is a factor but generally they're willing to negotiate their fee down if they are, don't have to travel anywhere. Thank you very much. Uh, Rana, anything else to add there? Good. No, I think Lisa is, Lisa, uh, is the right person to speak on that. Thank you. And um, now I have a question for, a two-part question for all of you. And I think this is a good general question to ask for all of our panelists. And I'm also going to copy and paste it here. What kinds of social events do you do or plan for the virtual conference? How were networking events organized? And uh, perhaps we can do the same order. We can start again with Wayne. Yeah, uh, so for the other two conferences, we had end of, well, first there was like a dedicated lunchtime. So you would have your concurrent sessions then break for lunch and then you can go into, for example, a lobby 
and we used lobby rooms and there was somebody working that lobby room. And if you wanted to, for example, um, talk about a particular presentation or a topic or something, the person organizing, the person hosting that lobby room could send you to a breakout room. So this is all through Zoom. So Zoom has breakout rooms. So they would send you to a breakout room and say, hey, I want to, we three want to talk about this, go to a breakout room. So that's how that might work in a, so we had lunchtime and then at the end, uh, there were dedicated break times, maybe 15 minutes break or half hour break. And then everybody could go into a lobby again, go to the breakout room. And then there was at the end of the conference, an actual social event on Zoom where everyone is uh, together on Zoom and um, BYOB, uh, bring your own, bring, or BYOD, bring your own drinks uh, at home, whatever, whatever you want to do. And it's just a time to decompress, right? Decompress and share ideas, et cetera. So that's kind of how that, that's kind of how that runs uh, for Jolt International. Those ideas are going to take that and maybe also maybe subdivide that. For example, if you want to do a particular networking Zoom room, or if you wanted to do that, we've also, um, there's another uh, software out there that we kind of discovered called spatial.chat. Uh, I can put it in the, uh, I can put it in the chat, spatial.chat. And it's another kind of, social networking kind of software. And with that software, just very briefly, that software, basically you see yourself on the screen. And if you move closer to the person on the screen, you can hear that person. If you move away from that person, you, you, you don't hear them. So if you imagine yourself in a restaurant or something, tables, the closer you get to a table, you start hearing the conversation in the table, you move away, it dims off. So that's another thing we've, a few of us have kind of in, in the organizing community have talked about maybe trying to use that as a way to uh, another kind of social space. So there are these things that we're kind of trying to work in, in terms of the social space and the uh, networking. But right now we're kind of using Zoom in very particular rooms, uh, lobbies, networking rooms, et cetera. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, Susan and Marsha, and I'm, I'm also going to paste here the same question. What kinds of social events do you do or plan for the virtual conferences and um, how were networking events organized? We would like Marjorie Walt <laughs> to take this one. She is our, um, she is our conference chair for the uh, annual conference this year. Um, hi, it's still very early here. I'm on my first cup of coffee, so bear with me. But um, so we did not have any social events at the uh, spring conference just because we were putting everything together so quickly. Big Marker didn't really allow for that kind of interaction. We've looked at a number of different um, platforms for the uh, fall conference, and a lot of them have various built-in social event options. They have um, these kind of social channels that people can join. You can set them up ahead of time. You can um, put, uh, there's an option to allow people to create their own during the event. Uh, there are lots of ways in which people can set up different uh, virtual um, synchronous and asynchronous uh, meetings with each other. So that's one thing that you really want to look for in your platform. Lisa may have more to say about that, but they, um, they do see the importance of these, these professional groups and putting together these platforms do see that uh, importance of that uh, social networking. We, we um, chose a platform for fall that has native streaming so that we didn't have to keep worrying about all these different Zoom links and rooms and, and so forth. It's all kind of built into the system, but that is going to be more expensive. Thank you very much, Margie. Thank you. And last but not least, Rana and Lisa, the same question. And I added I it here to the Lisa chat box. Is, uh, it will be in a better position to answer this question. Yes, Lisa, please. Okay, so um, uh, networking is a huge piece. So how we're handling it for the upcoming virtual convention is the platform actually has quite a bit of um, networking features built into it. Um, the platform kind of works almost like Facebook in that you create a, you create a profile, um, you're able to video chat with some people, you're able to message them. Uh, it also has a conversation board where people can kind of, um, we 
interact with one another kind of you know asynchronously um and then we're also planning some official networking topics that we'll actually take them out to zoom for because it's the easiest way to do it um the platform we are using does have collaboration rooms but in truth they were too expensive for the budget we had for this particular event um, but there are lots of options i'd say the biggest thing is making sure um, that it's easy that's the biggest thing is making sure that it's easy um, do some icebreakers get the chat the thing started um, but it can be done in a multitude of ways and it doesn't have to cost a fortune Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, okay, everyone, so with that, we must conclude today's online program. It is already 11 a.m. Eastern time. Today's presentation was titled Shifting Affiliate Events Online, a Global Phenomenon. If you do have any more questions, please do email our panelists, our wonderful panelists, and a uh, special thanks to all of you. As a reminder, um, you, um, you will be receiving a link with the recording. So everyone have a wonderful day. This concludes the program. You may now disconnect. Thank you all.